Coffee with the Editor is proudly brought to you by IRZ. So good morning Leanne and thank you so much for joining me for Coffee with the Editor. The last time we met, which I think was earlier this year, we chatted briefly about your symposium, which is the African Track and Technology Symposium, you were in the starting phase of, of developing that. Um, how's it going? We've made some changes, we've adapted by request from the industry. When we started, uh, if you remember, we had two modules, we had a first module for design and the second module for, for track maintenance. Um, industry, however, considering current circumstances, have been requested that we combine the two into one symposium. So we've combined the two modules into one now, so we only have one module, which will be from the 30th of September to the 4th of October. So now everything is squeezed into five days as opposed to two separate modules. In the symposium, we're trying to cover it basically right from the beginning. Um, we even go to the extent of saying let's start where a railway line starts and that's with, a, with an idea. Because I still think there's a lot of opportunity in South Africa and Southern Africa, especially Southern Africa, there's still lots of talks about the trans Kalahari railway line and there's talks about new heavy haul lines in the northern parts of, of South Africa and connecting with, like for instance, the Trans Kalahari line. So, and we've seen new lines having been built in, in Southern Africa uh, recently and at the moment in Northern Africa, as we know, in Kenya and so on. So, the uh, new railway line seems to be on the increase, which is very positive. Yeah, so that's basically where we start. We, that's the idea. We need a railway line. What do we do next? So, we start the symposium there already. <clears throat> and then we build it through all the different phases of, of uh, from concept to uh, feasibility, construction, and then of course where the bulk of the focus is of the symposium is on maintenance because for um, maybe the construction and, and feasibility will maybe last two or three years, but you know for the next 50 years you need to maintain the railway line. So the focus then is on mostly on, mm -hmm. as would, one would think, is on the maintenance part. And there we cover everything from whatever form of maintenance you can consider, we, will, we, we try to address it. So what I've noticed um, in Southern Africa, some of the lines that have been upgraded or rehabilitated is probably the better word. They're changing the actual weight of of the line, so they're upgraded to, in some instances, 45 kilograms. How, how does the change in that impact the, you know, the foundation of the track? Does it play a role? Well, it plays a huge role. Very often in, in Africa we find that they rather upgrade an existing line because that line is there already for a purpose. There's a mine somewhere, it goes down to a specific harbour or something. So generally that line is there for a specific reason. And then during the feasibility, and I've been physically involved as a consultant in one or two of these feasibilities, is then you start thinking, am I gonna build a new line or am I going to basically rehabilitate what I already have? And that decision is not that simple. And, and there are many things to consider. And, and exactly what you're saying is that foundation on which it's built, the form, we call it the formation, that was probably designed for a specific axle loading. And if you look at the typical structures in Southern Africa, for example, it's fairly light because it was light axle traffic that was considered at the time. So you'll find there's a very light rail on the, you know, the formation therefore was designed for. And when you want to upgrade it now to 20 plus tons, 
now you can't just go and put new steel and new sleepers and everything is going to be fine because firstly the formation is very old and you have to consider what could have happened to the formation and all the time you know water is the enemy of, of, of formation and you have to go and consider that and even then you can have to go and look at the compaction and and the material grading and everything else that was used and more often than not, you will find that it's just not suitable for any higher axillaries, which basically requires complete rebuild of the line anyway. Mm. Um, there are places in Southern Africa where they have tried to get away with it. Um, I think it is working to some extent. I've trolled some of those lines and, and it, is, it seems to be working in places. Mm. But I also know that it's not going to work for very long. Yeah. You know, it is going to fail. There's no doubt about it. So eventually, it is, it is going to fail. But maybe in the short term, it was a way out and a cheaper way out. Mm. Ideally, you want to pick everything up and build a new formation for the specific kind of axle loading, and then you have sleepers and steel specifically for the axle loading in mind. Mm. And then, so your course would cover this. The, the course will basically cover. How, how the whole system basically must be designed as a system. I do focus a lot on systems engineering. Um, we focus a lot on, uh, on a system of systems. You know, we're looking at, the, at the, the railway as a system of systems. It is not just the railway system or the OHTE system or any other system. It's, all of these systems must work together. And then when you get down to, to the lower order systems, when you, when you, when you, when you take the, the, the track only, you take everything else away, it also, is, it, it also has various components. All of those components must work together. Mm. So you have a, a big system that everything must fit together like a puzzle. And mm. if any part of that puzzle is not working, something is going to fail. And, and if it fails, it, it, it costs a lot of money. And, yeah, and, and normally, when during the feasibility already, Part of the feasibility say we expect so much income from uh, transporting so much goods or commodities or whatever from A to B and for that we need to have a certain axle loading and certain length of trains and we need a certain number of trains over a certain number of days or whatever. Yeah. And if anything goes wrong in between and you start reducing the number of trains, you know, your, your feasibility becomes less. Or if it's already happening, then you know the income is expected is not happening, and and then the investors will start to move uncomfortable in the chairs. But let's talk about um, the advancements in in technology in terms of track maintenance. I see I see a new program, and uh, you'll have the latest program available for people to uh, download shortly. Um, what do you think, or what in your opinion is probably the most exciting um, advancement in technology for track maintenance? Well, worldwide there's a lot of excitement, there's a lot of new things. I can remember just a few years ago, I was even talking to colleagues at the time and I, and I said to them, you know, if we look at the advancement of, of track maintenance technology since 1950s until today, and and you look at the machines of 1950s and you look at the machines of today and you think to yourself, my goodness, the technology has just... I wonder if there's any other industry that has had such big leaps in, in technology. And, and we were still like talking, I'm talking quite a few years ago, and we were still thinking, what is next? You know, how can we improve on, on what we have? Or have we already now reached a, a point of stagnation? And and I personally thought yes, and, but it, at the moment, if you look at Plaza and Toyo, which is which is also one of our big sponsors, they have suddenly did come up with the next logical um, step in in maintenance, and and uh, that is by using the OHDE as a power source, as opposed to using the diesel engine. Mm. Now, I was at a demonstration a few years ago where Plus and Tora reve uh, revealed one of these machines and, and it is absolutely fantastic because it's, it, it uses a diesel engine, it's still got a diesel engine, but it also has a pantograph like a locomotive and, 
and they can seamlessly change between the diesel engine and the electrical overheads. And the reason why this is of course an issue in Europe is noise and, and of course emissions. Now I'm talking now Europe, I'm not talking South Africa, but I'm really just talking in general about advances in, in, uh, in technology. So then noise is a big issue and of course emissions is a big issue. So you see this machine coming on, you can see the diesel fumes, you can see, you can hear it, this machine is tamping and it's coming, and it's coming fast because of course the speed of the machines are also increasing. And then seamlessly you can just hear the diesel engine going quiet, but the machine just carries on and there's no noise. And the only noise you hear is just the tamping units as it, as it enters the ballast. And even there, there were advances because uh, you know the whole vibration of the tamping units is also something that that, that generates quite a bit of noise um, because it's a vibration, you know. Mm -hmm. And and even there, the technology now is that um, the vibration goes up to the target vibration just before the tines enter the ballast, and as it exits the ballast, the vibration just about switches not switches off, but goes down to a minimum and the noise is a minimum. So it comes out of the ballast, it's quiet, it goes down just before it hits the ballast, it goes into maximum vibration and it, and it tamps and it comes up. So, so, so those are really, really exciting uh, technologies. And that's not the only one, there's plenty of others. There's track geometry recording and measuring and ultrasonic that's getting faster and faster and there's um, it's all sorts of other technologies that is basically being developed or being going into some level of adv advancement, which is really, really exciting. And I see that you're covering some of these advancements yes. in, in technology and mechanized track maintenance um, in your symposium, so that's quite exciting. Who are some of the key speakers? Um, we've got some really, really, really good speakers. Uh, I would say some of the most experienced people in South Africa. Um, we have the likes of uh, Friedel Molke, Dr. Friedel Molke. Um, he was uh, a very senior person in, in, in the old Spurnet. Dr. Chris Hutton. Uh, we have the likes of Dr. Willem Sprong. We have even people within Transnet that is uh, really keen to help and, and I would like to, to single somebody out, uh, uh, George Hetash, which, which is one of the very few rail wheel interaction specialists around. Kanak Mystery, which is really well known. Pinar, I mean, he's also well known. All right, so you've got some great sponsors for the African Track and Technology Symposium. Wistalpin Railway Systems is, is one of our most enthusiastic uh, sponsors. Um, they're also bringing speakers from Austria to come and, and do lectures on rails because you, as you would know, um, Wistel Pien is in rails and turnouts and that type of thing. So they will be sending some speakers as well. So we have some international speakers too. Plus Antoyers, as always, they, they are a, a big sponsor. Also RCE Consultants, a local consulting company. And then uh, PMC Media is, a, uh, is, is the publisher of my books. You, you know that I've published three different books. Um, and uh, they have sponsored some of my books f uh, that will be handed out as, uh, as, as, as uh, material, as symposium material. Um, of course then to do a symposium like this it's important to have high profile partners and in this case the high profile partner is SISI. So uh, Johan de Koeker is the current chairman of the Railways and Harbors Engineering Division so between the sponsors and, and SICE, it's, it's a really good team. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to this.